Hi, well, Merry Christmas, everyone. We are so glad that you're joining us online for this final message in our whole message series about the kingdom being revealed. Matthew records in his gospel for us, Jesus is teaching about the kingship of God and how God reigns and rules today. And we're going to wrap up that whole series today with a really fitting parable, a final parable from Jesus. But I wanted to start off with you with a great question. Whom is the most impressive, distinguished person you have ever known? If you're home right now, talk to your kids or talk to someone around you. Whom is the most impressive, the person who, who in your mind stands out the most that you have ever known in your life? Have you thought of that person? For many of us, it might have been a parent or a grandparent. Maybe you knew someone famous. Maybe it was a coach. Maybe it was a teacher, a professor. Uh, I know many of you are thinking you're pastor, right? That's what you're thinking, no. But many of us have known really important or impressive people, people that really stood out to us, people who had a tremendous impact or impressed us in some way. And I think when we think of those people, what makes a person impressive, what makes a person distinguished is when someone is different than other people. When someone really does stand out from other people, when that person is rare, rare things are impressive, distinguished. And I just want to tell you right up front as we wrap up this whole message series, what we've been learning in the Gospel of Matthew from Matthew, the former tax collector who became a disciple of Jesus. He's been teaching us in his Gospel when he selected things about Jesus, about being Jesus' disciples. What he means by that is that we can be Jesus' authoritative representatives on earth. That means we can be distinguished. We can be different. We can be rare. We can really stand out in our lives. And I want to tell you, this final parable we're about to read, Jesus makes that so clear. And Jesus said the way that you and I can be his disciples is that we need to obey him. He said in Matthew 6, Seek first God's kingship. And his righteousness, obey God. That's what it means to seek his kingship. And all these things will be added to you. You see, what we've been learning over these weeks is that God's kingship can be over our lives, but also through our lives. We can have God's presence and power and authority in our lives if we would obey what Jesus has taught us. If we would put that first, seeking that kingship of God over and through our lives, you and I can be distinguished. We can stand out. And so I just want to tell you right up front, what we're going to get into as we wrap all of this up today is if you want to live a distinguished life, devote yourself to obeying Jesus Christ. If you want to stand out, if you want to be different, if you want your life to be significant and important, not only now with God's authority and power now, but also in the kingdom to come when Jesus comes again, then obey him today and you will have heavenly authority and kingship and power, not only now, but in the life to come. You see, Jesus taught this when he was confronting the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Starting on that Tuesday morning, he went to the temple courts and he was teaching there in the beautiful, incredible temple that King Herod had built. I want you to know this was like 33 acres. This was just a huge, magnificent complex. It was one of the most outstanding things you could see in the whole ancient world. Everyone in the world, the important people, wanted to travel and see this amazing temple in Jerusalem that King Herod had built. King Herod was one of the most powerful men in the Roman Empire. And in fact, this whole 33-acre complex was built up on colonnades supporting all of it from a natural mountain underneath. He had built for years this incredible, beautiful place to worship God. And when Jesus was there, he was telling parables in the temple courts. And what we read in Matthew 21 already as we've been digging into this is that when he was teaching there in these parables, he was being both prophetic and confrontational. He had incited some confrontation with the Jewish religious leaders who thought that they were significant, that they were distinguished, that they were the most important people before God and before other people. They thought their lives were so amazing and so distinguished. But Jesus was confronting them about real authority, about truly having a distinguished life. And as he did it, he also did it as a prophet predicting the future 
of the downfall of these Jewish religious leaders and the nation of Israel for their lack of obedience. Remember, we looked at two parables that Jesus already was teaching there in the temple courts. And the first one was about an obedient and a disobedient son. And the point of Jesus' teaching is that God's authority would go to those who are obedient, not people that just say that they're going to obey God, but people who actually do it. And then he also told a parable about disobedient vineyard workers who represented these Jewish religious leaders who realized Jesus was talking bad about them. We read in Matthew 21. And he began to explain this in verse 43. Therefore, I say to you, the kingship, the royal authority of God will be taken away from you you Jewish religious leaders of Jesus' time, and given to a nation of people producing the fruit of it. God is looking for obedient believers so that he can give his royal authority and kingship to them. Not only now, but we'll share in the rule and the reign of Jesus when he comes again. So Jesus wraps all of this up in his teaching in the temple courts with these religious leaders and huge crowds of people around him with a final parable that puts all of this together. And it's also a great summary of what we've been learning over all of these weeks from Jesus' parables. Look at Matthew 22, verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying this, verse 2, the kingship, the way God rules and reigns over us, but also what we can embrace in our lives, may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Let's take a moment to talk about this. This is very, very important, all of these details. In his final big parable explaining prophetically what was going to come in the future and also explaining God's rule and reign and what it means to be significant and distinguished and to stand out from other people, Jesus explains that it's all like being invited to an incredible opportunity, a wedding feast of a king for his son. A king would be the most important person in the ancient world. And to have a wedding for the prince, for his royal son, his heir, would be the ultimate wedding party of all. The word for a wedding actually is weddings. It means wedding celebration. It means the whole event. A wedding celebration in the ancient world would begin, first of all, with a huge banquet the very first night. There would be preparations all day long, and then there would be a banquet in that evening. And to be invited to the party of all parties of a king and a wedding party for his son would be the ultimate invitation, an invitation that would be distinguished, that would make you stand out from other people. To be invited to something like that would be something you would never want to miss. And the way the wedding parties worked in that time is that someone important would send out his servants or his slaves who were often high up in his administration, and he would send them out to people to RSVP. He would send out an invitation to come to the wedding, to the wedding festivities, beginning with a huge banquet the very first night. And then the day of the wedding, he would send out servants again to tell everyone, now is the time. We've been cooking all day long. We prepared all of the meals for everyone who's RSVP'd. You know, in the ancient world, they didn't have all the preservatives. They didn't have all the refrigeration and things that we, we have. And so people would RSVP to the wedding party. And then the person throwing the party would prepare all of the food that very day. Butcher all of the animals. The ultimate would be like a cow. If there was just a few people, you might just have a chicken or something like that. But if it was a big party, like this is going to be for a king, they would have carefully prepared the food all day long, and then the servants would go out and say, all right, now is the time. This clearly represents, as we're looking at this, the king is God the Father. He has a son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the heir of all things. And you and I have been invited And people in past history have been invited to kingdom greatness, to a tremendous privilege. We'll talk more about this in a moment. But look at verse 3. He sent out this king, his slaves, to call those who had been invited, those who had RSVP'd, what a tremendous privilege to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. There's the shocker. Here's a group of people 
who are significant and important to this king. He's invited them to this tremendous privilege. They've RSVP'd for it. And now the time for the dinner has come. Now the actual celebration time has come. And they were unwilling to come. That's incredibly offensive for a king to have accepted these invitations, sent out invitations, and people accepted them and RSVP'd, and now they're unwilling to show up. But he is incredibly gracious in verse 4. Again, he sent out other slaves saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, behold, I have prepared my dinner. We've been cooking all day for this. My oxen, I've even slaughtered cows for this. This is like the biggest, most special meal it could ever make. And my fat and livestock are all butchered. And everything is ready. It's time now to celebrate. Come to the wedding feast. And if we, you remember the past parables Jesus has been told, telling us, clearly these servants who are being sent and inviting people represent the prophets and the spokespeople for God over history in the nation of Israel. But look at verse 5. But they paid no attention. That means that they just had no regard for it. They just took it all lightly. And they went their way. One to his own farm, another to his business, and even worse, verse 6, the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. And if you remember the other parables Jesus had already told in the Temple Mount, this represents the prophets of God who were sent to Israel time and time and time again, and yet they were mistreated. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, even up to the time of John the Baptist and now Jesus himself, who in the previous parable predicted that they would kill him. The nation of Israel had rejected God's spokespeople over and over and over again. It's like being invited to a wedding celebration and RSVPing, but then not showing up for it. The Jewish religious leaders of Jesus' time epitomized this whole reality. They were mistreating John the Baptist. Now they were mistreating him. They were special. They had been invited by God to great kingdom privilege, to have the authority of God in their lives, to be important and great in the kingdom to come, the messianic kingdom. And yet they had rejected that invitation. They didn't show up. And so this is very important in this parable. The wedding celebration, it's the invitation and the privilege of it that is so important in this parable. It represents the joy and the privilege of fully realizing kingship from God and the messianic kingdom. These religious leaders have been given this tremendous opportunity for God's authority over their lives and through their lives. And yet, when it came down to it, they didn't show up. You see, God, he invited them these leaders, and the whole people of Israel to greatness in kingdom authority. They were to be God's authoritative representatives for all of the other nations. The leaders were supposed to be God's authoritative representatives to the Jewish people. But they had all failed because they didn't show up. They RSVP'd. But when it actually came time to accepting the invitation fully, and showing up in righteousness and responding to God's prophets and responding to John the Baptist and now to Jesus. They didn't want to be obedient. They didn't really want the kingdom authority after all. They had said yes, but then said no in actual practical reality of life. You see, they didn't show up. You know, uh, one of the worst things... It's when we don't show up to something. I know there's times where I have meetings with people or we set things uh, ahead of time where I'm supposed to, to be around people or be at a party. And I have to absolutely put those things on my calendar. I have to write it down and I need notifications on my phone that remind me and tell me I'm just like your typical man, right? And I have to be reminded over and over and over again. But I got to have it on my calendar. I got to have it. But in the end, in the end, all those reminders and things, it has to be important to me. 
and I have to know what's coming, and I have to be ready for it, and when the time comes where I'm supposed to meet someone or be at a party or whatever it is, I've got to show up. I've got to show up. It's a reflection on me of how important that person or that group of people are to me. And in the same way, the Jewish people and these Jewish leaders have been invited to kingdom greatness. But time and time again, they have been invited, invited, and invited, and they didn't show up. And you know how offensive it is when you have an appointment with someone or you're going to have lunch with someone or you've invited someone to a party and that person has said yes, but then they don't show up. Verse 7. The king was enraged for good reason. And he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Here's Jesus speaking as a prophet through this parable And what he is proclaiming here is that God is going to be angry about this as God had been with Israel over history before. He had used people like the Babylonians and the Assyrians and other nations to bring judgment on the nation of Israel. In the same way, God's going to do it again, Jesus is announcing here. And you will be destroyed physically and your city will even be burned. You know, the leaders and the people of Jerusalem, they experienced a terrible judgment in 70 AD. Jesus went on to predict in Matthew, in Matthew 24, that there would be no stones left of the Temple Mount at all. There would be no temple anymore or any beautiful buildings there anymore. And all of that happened in 70 AD. Not only that, but the city was surrounded, as Jesus predicted, by the Roman army, The siege of Jerusalem lasted over five months. And when it was all said and done, the city was burned to the ground. There was no more temple. Can you imagine this for a moment? The beautiful temple, the center of everything, was completely wiped away. Every stone on the temple mount was pushed off and destroyed. The city itself, when you go there today, you can actually go underground to Jesus' time back in time as you go underground and you can see the burned timbers and the burned paintings on the walls of the actual homes in Jerusalem. You can go, now they have uncovered just this last year, the sewers of the city where the final holdouts were holding out in this fight against the Romans and they were hiding from the Romans as they came into the city and they were killed in the sewers, the families that were hiding there. There's Roman sword that has been found and the bones of the people who were killed in the sewers. Josephus, the historian, tells us that more than a million Jewish people died because of this conflict. It was a terrible, terrible judgment. But that's because God held Israel accountable for this tremendous privilege, this tremendous responsibility. And they had said no and no and no again. And they had mistreated God's messengers over and over and over again. And for that, they received temporal judgment from God. So if Israel was held accountable, and God is moving on now to another group of people like you and me, what does that mean for us? That's the rest of this parable. Look at verse 8. Then the king said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not deserving. You see, Jesus and his kingdom are coming. It's very, very, very soon. That is the time that you and I are living in. The nation of Israel and these Jewish leaders, God still has a plan for the nation of Israel that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24 and 25. He's still not done. There is going to, in the future, be a glorious Israel. But for now, as a whole, the leadership and the Jewish people of a whole have said no. And they did this to themselves. Jesus is saying, they've made themselves unworthy. They've made themselves not deserving of it. Verse 9, go therefore, the king announces, to the main highways, to the countryside is the picture here, and as many as you find there, anyone and everyone, invite to the wedding feast. That's our time. Do you know the time that we're living in? God is saying, open the doors. Before, it was the Jewish people, and they were tremendously privileged. They were direct descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had a glorious temple. They had this 
amazing connection to God through all of this history with God and what God had done for them. But now we're living in a time where God's looking for anyone and everyone. Verse 10. Those slaves went out into the roads and they gathered all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. You and I are living in a time where we don't stand out as much as the great Jewish people did in their history and their beautiful temple. And I have to tell you, in New Testament times, in Jesus' time, the morals of the Jewish people compared to the pagan Romans was a vast, vast difference. The value of marriage, sex, sexual acts that the pagans did. There was such a vast difference in the lives of Jewish people compared to pagans. But God is saying in this, and Jesus is being prophetic in this, that God in our time has just kind of opened the doors to the bad and the good. You know, you and I, we are living in a time, a new time. This is so important for history. Jesus was being prophetic here. We kind of take it for granted, but we're living in a whole new time that Jesus predicted when people are being invited in greater numbers than ever before. God's just opened the doors. He's opened the invitation like never before. He's lowered the bar in many, many ways. He's made it easier for people today to accept the kingdom invitation. Before it was through the nation of Israel and their beautiful priests and their beautiful temple and their beautiful spokespeople and everything that God had put in place for the nation of Israel. Today, it's just more like just open to everybody. It's not maybe so beautiful even sometimes, but nevertheless, God wants to fill up this invitation to kingdom greatness. It's kind of like when I go into Costco today, you know, there's clothes there at Costco. And when I walk around, I can see them. And there's sometimes some very distinguished kind of labels like um, that you normally only see in Nordstrom or in a catalog or something like that, like Orvis. Or I noticed golf shirts recently from Travis Matthew that before I'd only seen it like a Nordstrom or some very, very fancy place. But now I see it and it's in Costco. And I don't mean to offend any of you watching this right now, but it's kind of that way with you and I in the church today. There was Israel and the nation of Israel and all of their beauty and their temple and all the things that God had done. And today, it's kind of like Nordstrom to Costco. We're the ones that are being invited to the kingdom where it's just open to anyone. It may not be kind of as prestigious on the, on the outside, but what we're being invited to is to be just as distinguished as all of those amazing people from Israel's history from before, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and the wonderful prophets of God, Isaiah, Jeremiah, of Samuel, of so many distinguished people in God's history. You and I are being invited today to be just as distinguished. God's kind of lowered the bar, but what we're being invited to is no lower it's incredible what God is doing. But that means just as Israel needed to show up in righteousness, you and I also need to show up. And that's the final part of this parable. Look at verse 11. When the king, after filling up this party, remember they had prepared all the animals all day long and now there's this huge wedding banquet. The people of the city didn't show up. The, the people that should have shown up didn't show up, so they went out into the countryside and just gathered anyone and everyone that they could to come. He came in to look over the dinner guests, and he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Of this huge, huge group of people, the picture is the king is looking out at this huge group of people, but he spots one particular man who's not dressed for the occasion. Even the most common people in ancient times, you had your work clothes, but you also had like your Sunday clothes. You had your clothes that you would wear to a wedding, which were often just plain white clothes that you would wear there. But this man had just shown up and he hadn't even taken the time to change his clothes. He wasn't dressed. You know, the way we dress for an occasion gives a picture to other people of how we feel, how important that event is. I brought a coat with me. You may wonder why I have a coat here. I don't normally wear one. But I brought a coat to put on. 
Because when I put this coat on, it represents something. Sometimes I go to meetings or I go to different events or I have a wedding and I put a suit on. But when I put on a piece of clothing like this, it's telling you that I think something is important, that it's significant, that I want to be dressed. When I, when I get ready for a wedding or I'm going to have a funeral or some other kind of event with people, I will often ask them, what, what are you planning to wear? What would you like to wear? I want to make sure that I'm not underdressed. In fact, I'll find out what people are wearing and then I might take it up another notch because I want them to know that I think it's very important. And what I wear presents that to people. So when the king came to the party, he noticed that one man had not even taken the time to put on some better clothes. He just wore his work clothes to the king's party. Verse 12. And so he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here? How did you enter this place without wedding clothes? Why didn't you change? And the man was speechless. He, he didn't even put on the wedding clothes. He didn't have it on. And so the king comes and directly talks to him. And they know each other. They, they have a connection there. He, the, you know, he, the king doesn't say, you weren't invited to this. You're not supposed to be here at all. You've accepted the invitation and you're here, but I'm telling you, you didn't dress appropriately. Why, why didn't you just change into your wedding clothes that you have? It was offensive. The man was saying, this isn't important to me. Just as the Jewish people had treated God's invitation to kingdom greatness, these Jewish leaders that Jesus was confronting at the temple, they just treated that as unimportant and they cared more about their farms and the things that they were doing and they had just not paid any special attention to it. Now this man had come to this party, but he didn't even bother to change his clothes. He didn't show up again. He didn't show up in righteousness. That's what this is representing. He didn't actually... Do and obey Jesus. He didn't do what Jesus wanted him to do. He wasn't an authoritative representative for Jesus. He wasn't a disciple of Jesus. He had just completely disregarded that. This represents for us Christians, if you can just imagine this for a moment, who don't take anything seriously about their kingdom invitation and obeying Jesus and being an authoritative representative for Jesus. If you think of the Jewish people, over centuries, there were millions and millions and millions of Jewish people who would have believed in a coming Messiah or believed in Jesus. But how many of them were obedient to what God had told them to do? If you think of Christian history, billions of people have believed in Jesus as their Savior. But how many Christians have obeyed Jesus how many Christians have been his authoritative representatives on the earth? Have they been his disciples? And so when Jesus comes again, what this represents to us, we need to be ready. We need to show up. We need to be his authoritative representatives. We need to be distinguished. Verse 13, if we don't, the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the darkness outside. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And don't jump to the conclusion when you hear weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a, this is a picture of profound regret. And in this parable, there's a huge party that's going on. This wedding celebration, this special privilege, it represents kingdom authority. And this man is removed from that. And he's removed outside of this joyful, lit-up banquet into the darkness outside of that. If you look at Matthew chapter 8, this is a picture of privilege of like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who have great privilege in the kingdom to come. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 8 that sons of the kingdom, real believers, can be removed out of that into the darkness outside. And that is a picture not of hell, but a picture of you and I being removed from the privilege and the distinct, being distinguished in the kingdom to come of ruling and reigning with Jesus. 
You see, this man represents a believer, a Christian, who in the end just has no regard for God's kingship and God's authority, who doesn't care anything. He just shows up and he thinks he's going to have it, but he doesn't have it. He's removed from it. Just as the Jewish people needed to show up, you and I as believers today, we need to show up in righteousness for God. My best picture of this for you, this may be a little silly or something, but have you ever seen a Thomas Kincaid painting? There's always a home in the distance and he has all this light and it's kind of a beautiful setting. But when you see those paintings, here's another picture of one. When you see these, you're meant to think there's something special going on inside of that home. It's a beautiful ideal scene. Inside is something that you want to get to. There's such light and there's such beauty there. And this is exactly what Jesus' parable is all about. There's a great wedding celebration. This is a picture of God's kingship and authority and privilege and honor and glory that God can give to you and I. But that banquet, that banquet is something that we have to show up for. We have to arrive there in righteousness. We got to be dressed up for it. We got to fulfill our RSVP. And when we do that, we get to be a part of it. If we aren't, then we're removed to the darkness outside of that festivity and that glory and that honor. That's the picture of this parable. And Jesus tells us this in verse 14. For many are invited. Many are invited. Many are invited to greatness in the kingdom to come. Many are invited to God's heavenly authority to rule and reign with the Messiah. But few are, in the end, distinguished. Many, many, many are invited, but few show up. Like I told you before, in the history of Israel, think of the millions of Jewish people. How many of them believed and were born again? Many, many, many were. But how many lived a distinguished life like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? How many of them? Few. And in the church today, where billions of people have believed in Jesus as Savior, how many Christians in Christian history, are going to show up and be Jesus' authoritative representatives? Few. And remember, that's what makes someone distinguished. That's what makes someone stand out. That's what makes a person special. That we are rare. That we are different. And to sum up this whole message series and what Matthew has recorded for us and what Jesus was trying to do, he was saying, John the Baptist and then Jesus, the kingdom is almost here. It is almost here. Get ready. Get your life together. Make changes in your life. Let God change your life. Get ready for kingdom authority. And if you want to have a distinguished life, devote yourself to obeying Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus announced through a series of parables right there on the Temple Mount. He said, this is what's going to matter. This is what's going to come. God's going to move on. You Jewish leaders, you don't want this. Then he's going to move on to people who do want it. And he's going to hold them accountable too. But if they'll accept that invitation and that they will show up in righteousness, if they'll dress themselves appropriately, obeying what I've taught them, then they will get this tremendous privilege and honor. It's like a celebratory banquet on the wedding night for a king's son. A special, special, distinguished honor. A couple of weeks ago, a man named Dan Gable, he received the highest civilian honor that a person can receive in our country in the United States, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Why did he get it? He had a distinguished life in wrestling. Here's a list of all of his accomplishments. Two state titles. He won his first 118 matches. He won gold at the 1972 Olympics. He didn't even give up a point. And then not only did he live a life of wrestling, he went on to teach other people. He coached at the University of Iowa And he led them to so many championships. Over 21 years, he was a coach there. And so here's a picture of him receiving this honor. And when you see him receiving this honor, what you can say for sure is there's one thing you can say about this man. He devoted himself 
to wrestling, didn't he? He devoted himself to wrestling. Not only did he do it in his own life, but he taught other people how to do it. He was absolutely devoted to wrestling. And for that, he is distinguished. He stands out from other people. But here's the thing. When it comes to God, and it come, when it comes to what will make us distinguished and special and recognized in eternity, there's only one way to do that. You have to be devoted to Jesus. You have to be devoted to Jesus. If you will obey him, and you will become his authoritative representative, his disciple, your life will be distinguished. You see, it's one thing to believe in Jesus as your Savior. It's another thing to obey him, to receive God's kingship, his authority over your life and also through your life. And then when Jesus comes again and the kingdom comes, you will be recognized as distinguished. Will you show up? Will you be dressed appropriately? If you want to live a distinguished life, devote yourself to obeying Jesus. You see, this is a fitting conclusion to everything we've talked about over all of these weeks in looking at the parables of Jesus. Kingship authority can be yours and mine both today and when Jesus comes again. But to have it, we got to be devoted to Jesus. We've got to be his disciples. We've got to be his authoritative representatives. Let's pray together. Father, I praise you for today that we could dig into your word and the way that it challenges us and changes us as your people. Father, your invitation to the kingdom, to kingdom greatness and royal authority and ruling and reigning with Jesus, this is a privilege beyond all privileges. And Father, thank you for making it so easy for us today in the church as your people to come to believe in your son and to begin a new life, Father. You've opened the door to all over this world through the power of your spirit. That many people, more than ever before, are being invited to this kingdom privilege. And so, Father, we don't take that for granted. And as a church, we want to be ready. We want to be dressed appropriately. We want to show up in righteousness. So we pray that your spirit would help us to obey our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we long for that day when he will come again and our lives will be recognized as distinguished. Thank you for that privilege. Thank you for this special invitation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday.